this is another Monday and we're going to continue with engineering management. So what we're going to do today is finish up systems development life cycles that we, um, I started talking about last week. And then we're going to get into part two of today and part two of today is decision support and artificial intelligence. And before the day is done, or the, the or class time is done, I should say, not the day, but before the class time is done, well, actually the day might be done at that point as well, but long story short, I'm going to go over the CSLO essay for this course as well. That's been posted, it's in the LMS, it's on the bhacker.com website, and I'll go over a little bit of that as well. And uh, actually, just a little bit of house cleaning right now, just to get this out of the way as well. Um, our final exam, because people keep asking me, is going to be on October 19th, October, August 19th, August 19th, Monday, August 19th, with a makeup day on Wednesday the 21st. So both classes, my earlier class and this one, so I have a class at 11 and I have a class at 2. If you like 11 o'clock better and you're only taking one exam or you're taking both exams, you can come in at 11 or you can come in at 2. You can take this class or you can take the other class. You could take one on Monday and one on Wednesday. Or you could take both on Wednesday if you don't like Monday. Wednesday, I don't have the time yet. I have to clear it with the office to see when I can get it. To, uh, because the student services have to do surveys and they have to, I have to make sure that I'm not going to be... Um, placing a burden on them um, in terms of administering exams. And it will probably be one time slot in the morning. It will probably run on Wednesday from like say 11 to 2 or something like that. Uh, but I don't have the times yet. It will be two hours, but I don't have the time yet. I wouldn't wait and do everything on Wednesday, but if you want to split them out, you're in the OS class and you're also in the EM class, you don't have to take them both on the same day. You can take one on Wednesday, one on Monday if you want. Or you can take them both on Monday and get them all over with. Questions on the final exam schedule? I know it doesn't seem like this class has gone that far, but it's still one, two, three weeks away. <laughs> uh, because this week starts the 1st of August, actually, on Thursday. So it's about three weeks away. So we're, we are coming down the home stretch. So, All right, so let me finish up a few things on software uh, software development life cycle models. So last time I was focusing on the waterfall model. And if you mentioned, uh, if you remember, it was a series of steps, and the steps were phases that went from, I'm looking for a picture of it, it went from an initial um, requirements analysis, or um, even maybe even before that, with a, um, oh, what do you call it, feasibility study, here it is, here's the picture I wanted, to planning, to analysis, to design, to development, to testing, to implementation, to maintenance, and this modeled a cycle for software engineering, for software development. As an engineering manager, you're generally using and working with these life cycle models, as well as project management, um, to get uh, projects completed. Usually they're engineering projects as well, of some sort. And unfortunately, engineering is a very wide, broad field, so it's really hard to uh, hard to pinpoint exactly what type of project you might be working on, uh, but uh, in any case, models themselves are used to help structure the uh, project and help organize your work and make sure that you're actually completing a sound design. <clears throat> so the theory is use a software development lifecycle model and uh, you'll create a better end product um, and you'll create something that is um, something that not only is uh, hopefully not as full of bugs, but uh, there's no guarantee but maybe something that's repeatable or something that meets of a better quality than if you hadn't planned it at all. So those people um, who work in software try to strategize what they're trying to implement and the way that they're doing it and the resources that they're using to save money and to do things quickly. Because uh, if you don't watch certain things, what ends up happening is your project never ends. Or if it does, then it costs too much money. It's not worth the expense of actually doing it. Or you actually have to ask for a budget ahead of time. And then using that budget, you're supposed to implement something. Well, how are you going to allocate your resources? That's a, the interesting question. So the software uh, development lifecycle model called the waterfall model is the oldest, the most traditional format. It runs with sequential steps from point A to point B. Now, we have some alternatives to that. So today I'm going to talk about the differences with different models. And I mentioned a couple of these already, but I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail on um, all of them. So RAD is the one I mentioned actually already, which is Rapid Application Development. And Extreme Programming 
uh, abbreviated by XP. That's not Windows XP, it's extreme programming. And then agile methodologies, which are very popular these days. In fact, more so than anything else, you hear the word agile. But then again, it has turned into a buzzword. It's kind of like object orientation was for a while. Everyone, everything was object oriented, now everything's agile. So <laughs> you just slap that word on there and people think, oh, it's modern. You know. And what these are, these are component-based development methodologies. <clears throat> Rather than huge projects, you know, like uh, building brand new systems, not looking at a component by component assembly, but as a big system assembly, you could use these in combination. For example, you can use the waterfall model to schedule out, we're building a new um, HR system, or we're building a new Salesforce automation system or something. <clears throat> and then use the methodology to schedule everything out. And then inside, use an agile or an extreme or rapid application development sub-approach for each one of the components, perhaps, or something. So these models are not usually used in isolation. Usually they're used in combination. So just think, you're not picking one out that's going to be used. You're picking out a combination of techniques to accomplish what you're interested in accomplishing your objectives or your goals. So rapid application development, the first item here, um, also called rapid prototyping. So it emphasizes extensive user involvement in the rapid and evolutionary construction of a working prototype. Well, the prototype is the software. So the prototypes are the models or the software components. Um, you can have evolutionary prototyping, or you can have prototyping that is um, throwaway. They call them throwaway prototypes, where you start out with a, throw with a prototype and then you replace it with the real system. Um, Google actually uses some sort of an approach similar to rapid application development, but there's a couple of twists on that, actually. Um, everything is really, well, starting with about, I don't know, probably Gmail or before Gmail. Gmail is the only one I can kind of, like, at least identify clearly. Um, Gmail is definitely a prototype when it first came out. <clears throat> and if you remember, I should have taken some screenshots of it, you know, about 10 years ago, when it was simply a web-based pop, I think it was pop-oriented, yeah, pop web-based um, email program. And um, didn't have any features, didn't do anything. Actually, most of the web browsers, Netscape, Firefox, um, started out this way. It was a web browser that you downloaded and you used, but it wasn't functioning. I mean, half of the features didn't work. It didn't have very many features on it. I even think Yahoo at one point came out with a web browser <laughs> that was customized for what? Yeah, it's kind of like Chrome for Google, I guess. Yahoo actually, that, but it went away. So there's very low risk in this, which is what I'm basically bringing this as an example for. You didn't spend a year developing an email program to put it on the market to find out that nobody liked it. Instead, you didn't spend any time on it. You just put it, well, you spent a little bit of time. You let, you, know, you put something together so you could prototype it. And this is what's called a functioning prototype. So the prototype evolves turns into the final product, or it could turn into the final product. But if you're doing this, depending upon, and I'm not talking about Google, I'm just talking about examples of prototyping in general, what a lot of people do <coughs> is develop the prototype, fix the prototype, get it working, use it for to examine the user experience, what features, put tracking in there or something. If I'm building a web browser as an example, find out what people are actually using, what things seem to be working, send information back to the company who's making it automatically through the interface. Keep track of what's going on, how many people are using it, how, how long do they use it, what do they use it for, and then build, keep building and keep adapting it to see if you get an increased usage from it or to see if people are using it differently with different features. And then replace it with something that's stable. So you're building something out there that's live that your customers are looking at and then you also have something else in the back room that you're building that might be more sound. It might be built differently in different programming language or different kind of methodologies or something. And then eventually you're going to swap it. And then when, they, when you swap it, people go, oh, well, it's a brand new version. People do this with apps all the time, actually. You put the first app out, you build it, you set, and then you upload it, and you switch it around. And it's like, whoa, different UI. Wow, different app because you learned about what people were using it for and how things worked with it and then you put out a better version. It's a form of rapid application development where you don't have to wait. It's rapid because you're putting it out before it's even built so it's, and it's a prototype. So development team continually designs, develops, and tests the components of the prototype until they're finished. And then when they're finished they have the first release 
And so they might name it differently than the original release that they put out. You're certainly not going to call it a prototype. Actually, a lot of app games end up, they don't call them prototypes, but there's nothing in them. You download, you can look at it and say, well, why, why, did, why, why, why am I using this thing? There's nothing in it. <laughs> but uh, maybe there's something about it you like or something. And then if you're sending feedback or if you have some sort of a feedback loop going on with your customers, then you can kind of get, well, why did you uninstall this? Why did you use it? Why are you using this? And then how many people are going to be upgrading is a, is a good test as well. It's kind of like what Apple did, actually, with all the iPods. <clears throat> you know, they if you buy one iPod, I think the average person I think is supposed to buy four iPods. It went up. Uh, a couple years ago, it was three iPods, which means <clears throat> that's how many times you'll upgrade your hardware as they develop new things. So if they're looking at people who uh, transition into phones from that, how many times will you upgrade your iPhone? Well, you got about three or four generation out of that before you have to put out something brand new, according to their model. So you figure out how often people will do that, and you notice the decline as new mo models come out, and then you radically change the implementation of the model or what, what it is you're delivering to bring the curve back up to get more people to buy it, which is generally linked to contracts or it's linked to special services or something that you can't get unless you buy a new phone kind of thing. So <clears throat> they tried to do that with 4G for a while, and it, it's still sort of working. You have to get rid of your 3G phone in order to get a 4G. So if you, redu if you produce a product that works on 4G or a piece of software, then you're guaranteed you're going to get customers to go buy it. So there's a, there's a purchase strategy to it. Um, and knowing your audience and knowing how many times you're going to upgrade will help you figure out what kind of development cycle. Now, this is what I'm talking about right now, actually, is sort of a side tangent. It's actually the product life cycle and not the development life cycle. But the two of them sort of work together. You want to make sure that your development life cycle is working with your product life cycle so that you can hit different times of development and release different prototypes at different times to maximize your product life cycle. You want to get people using your product as long as they can. <laughs> if, unless you're releasing something new, then you want to get them the transition. But your development cycle might be linked in terms of its timing. So to be able to adjust that, the rapid application and these component-based development methodologies uh, give us more flexibility so we can basically integrate it better with the product life cycle and the phase out of the products. So it's a better it's a better match for development. <clears throat> so what are we looking at here? Oh, this is just a picture of the model. So we plan, do a little bit of analysis ahead of time. Say, hey, we're going to build a, a web browser. Okay. And then we uh, find a reusable software components and software library that already exists where we can put it together. Well, that's why a lot of people actually use, um, well, jQuery, or they use, um, well, Ruby, Ruby on Rails. <laughs> they use uh, components, pieces that somebody already wrote to put it together. So you use pieces, actually, no criticism for the EMS, but that was our, that's a, that's a Rails application. That's, that's using pre-existing components, putting it all together. It's a, it's a, it's a prototype. It's a rapid application prototype. Um, which will soon be replaced, hopefully, with, uh, well, we're getting a better GUI. It's coming up. We're working on it starting this week. Actually, if you guys have an interest in this, I think it's uh, Wednesday or Tuesday. Did I send something out to the students? We're having meetings. If anyone's interested in participating, let me know. It's happening this week, I believe, on Wednesday and Thursday. There's sessions in the morning and in the afternoon this week. Um, we have a third-party company who's going to take a look and revamp the user experience and the user interface for the EMS. Make it more user friendly. You know, make it actually functional. <laughs> make it, well, the, it actually is functional, but finding the features is a different story. So if you're interested in participating, I'm, a, I'm actually supposed to do this, and I totally forgot this morning. Um, I'm actually supposed to see if I can find some students who want to go to this and tell you about it um, so that you can participate in this study if you want. You don't have to, but if you like voicing your opinion and you like being part of a focus group, it's going to be sort of like a focus group. They're going to sit you down at a big table and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions like, well, what do you think about the class management? What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Which is what you should do if you're going to you know, talk to your users, find out what is they like, what is they don't like, what's working, what's not working. And then because they have a fresh set of eyes, they've never used the system before, 
they're going to go in and rethink rethink the pattern and the usage of the system to give us and hopefully I want to say by October maybe then we'll have it implemented so we'll have a different UI same functionality same features but different look and feel usability so uh, but uh, that system is the point I was bringing it was built with third-party tools and components and things it's which is the rapid way of doing something to begin with but because it was done in a rapid kind of prototyping technique prototyping is the system you're using today uh, which means it probably could use some um, better sound software development to it which is what it's getting now so it brings it makes it a little bit more sophisticated less of a prototype more of a usable system kind of thing uh, so building the new software components you're putting you're turning them into a cycle so you're designing development testing prototyping designing development testing figuring out how you're going to do it, then you're integrating all the test software components together in your implementation and then you're maintaining it. So before, and the reason why I wanted to bring up that picture before was before I sh you've seen like this colored thing, the waterfall model that goes from left to right, it kind of goes in a straight line. This is the equivalence, but there's no straight line here. Instead there's this iterative approach here going on with these steps, and there's not too many steps to it. So this is an equivalent software development lifecycle model. It uses different methodology, different frame of mind, different thinking. Instead, you're iteratively developing prototype cycles, and the cycles are using components that are readily available to you, depending upon the environment that you're working in. So that's kind of the rapid application prototype summary or overview. If you take a software engineering course, in Software Engineering 1, you generally spend several weeks focusing on the development lifecycle models because that's a huge part of it. So now we have extreme programming. Uh, our component base uh, number two, extreme programming or XP. It breaks a project into tiny little phases and then developers cannot continue on to the next phase until they finish the phase, the first phase. So you finish one phase, you go to another phase, you go to another phase but they're small phases and you do them so here we go so we have a uh, planning stage everybody's got planning there's feasibility studies there's plannings and there's requirements everyone's pretty much going to do that and you're pretty much going to do it first because and then at the end you always have maintenance and somewhere between the beginning and the end you have an implementation it's generally the programming part of it and the implementation that varies so from an implementation standpoint here you're doing your analysis, your design, your development, your testing, your implementation, your analysis, your design, your testing, but you're doing it component by component. So you break it down into tiny, itsy bitsy little pieces and you divide it up by developers. And then the developer finishes something, then they move on to the next, then they move on to the next. They used to call this the divide and conquer technique because uh, you divided up the project, you finished each one of the individual steps, you brought it all back together, and you conquered the tackled the problem all together. Instead of working at it as a big problem, as a big whole. So it was divide and conquer because you didn't look at the big project. In a waterfall model, you're looking at everything. You're looking at everything merged in together. And even in uh, rapid application development, you're looking at the entire big picture together. Here you have smaller, more accomplishable pieces. You could outsource part of it. You can insource part of it. Um, you don't have to treat it all the same. And then each developer is pretty much responsible for its own little piece. So people do extreme programming with um, UI development. They do it with networking development, with new technologies. Because what ends up happening is you'll have an expert. You'll hire the expert. The expert will do something on maybe they're a GUI expert or something. They'll finish their part completely. And then they'll move on to something else, another project or something. And then the rest of the project could still be worked on. So, so it's a variation of the waterfall, not necessarily using a prototype, but um, it definitely is a, a divide and conquer kind of approach. Now we have Agile. Agile is the biggest hit word here. It's a form of extreme programming. Aims for customer satisfaction through early and continuous delivery of useful software components. Well, that's not very much of a description. However, I'll tell you something that's extremely important with Agile in order to make it work correctly. You have to involve the customer. <laughs> so these other ones are all talking about the development team. In an Agile kind of approach, customer is part of the development team. The customer is signing off on certain things and building certain things. They may not necessarily be specifying exactly what they want up front because they may not even know. So instead what they do is they say, hey, I need this feature. 
And this feature is going to do this and that and that and that. And yeah, can you build it for me? And then I can tell you if I like it or not. So they're getting it. And it's a combination of a prototype, a combination of an implementation. They're getting it component by component. And they're actually involved. They're not sitting at a desk and waiting for you know, somebody to go deliver it to them. You know, oh, hey, it's done. No, instead, the developer could be building something, and then you're looking at it as a customer. You go, hey, I don't like that. Can you change the background color, do this, do that, do that? So you have a lot of meetings, a lot of involvement. Um, you definitely have to have people skills if you're working in this type of development. And then you have to basically be able to also formulate contracts and stuff with this so that you don't spend going around, spend your wheels going around and around and not producing anything. And it's generally component based and you're delivering small little pieces that are going to end up being the big picture. So we have a little piece at a time and customer satisfaction is your biggest, your biggest kind of, um, your, your biggest criteria. So, and then you're delivering something, you're not waiting six months to a year to deliver it, you're delivering it now. So, unfortunately this doesn't work unless you have an involved customer. If you have an uninvolved customer, or you have a big company and there's nobody who's the project lead, this is not going to work for you. <laughs> but everyone says everything's agile these days because agile is the key word, right? What does agile mean? It's flexible. Well, yeah, it is flexible. We can change things around, but how are we going to change things around if we have a customer who's involved with this? So It's kind of like building a house these days, actually. If you build a house in the United States, you uh, pretty much have to be part of the construction team. <laughs> Outside of that, you're not going to know what you're going to get. So you have to go in. When the inspectors show up, you got to show up to see what do they find wrong? What's going on? You have to kind of keep on top. It's kind of like managed care. If anyone's ever had a relative who's been in the hospital in the United States, you got to have to manage what's going on with them, too. You have to manage the nurses. You have to manage the doctors. It's agile. <laughs> so it's not so good for the customer. <laughs> Much better for the development team. Customers are actually going to get what they want, but you have to actually get involved. You have to get managed. Unfortunately, what ends up happening in this country is people don't understand with certain things like building a house or medical, stuff like that. You don't get involved. You don't get what you want. <laughs> it's kind of a terrible thing to say, but that's kind of what happens. It's kind of like party planning, actually. Anyone's ever done any party planning? It's kind of like agile software development. Unless you're there going, okay, where's the this or where's the that? Where's doing this? Who's doing that? It's not going to get done, well, to your satisfaction. It might get done, but it may not necessarily be exactly the way you wanted it. There's a lot of houses out there I kind of look at and go, why did they put the second story on like that? It makes no sense. You've got to go outside around the side of the house to get up to the second story. What? Why didn't I put a staircase in there? Because the customer didn't, get a, didn't look at it until it was completely done or something. And then that's why the house is for sale. So. <laughs> Cost too much money to fix it at this point. Okay, so software oriented architectures. So we're skipping, or we're just skipping, we're moving on to another topic now. So we can look at this from an architecture perspective. So, excuse me, service oriented, let me say software, service oriented architecture, SOA. It's like, I, I, you know why? Because I kept thinking software as a service, which is a different, <laughs> different acronym, different concept. Uh, perspective, uh, well, Focusing on the development, the use, and the reuse of small self-contained blocks of code called services to meet all the application software needs. So this is, they used to call this um, COTS, uh, off-the-shelf, custom off-the-shelf something, or so I don't know what the COTS stood for. The, the term's not used anymore because it's too confusing, obviously. I can't even remember. Does anyone remember what COTS stands for? C-O-T-S. Custom off the, the custom off the shelf. <laughs> custom off the shelf, off the shelf. I remember, because then they okay. So then people say, "Well, COTS is too hard. Let's call it off the shelf." And then they say, "Okay, off the shelf." Now it's called service oriented architecture. <laughs> what services do you want? Here's some components that will provide those services for you. And anyway, what ends up happening is you get off the shelf solutions for this. So off the shelf is the guy who makes an accounting program, ABC Acme Inc., some development company, makes an accounting program. 
They have the basic features down. Everyone who buys, what's what? commercial off the shelf? Okay, custom was the part that was bothering me. So it's commercial. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Google search engine <laughs> or whatever or Bing or whatever you used. <laughs> okay, commercial off the shelf. Um, anyway, long story short, you develop an accounting program. Your ABC Acme Inc. or whatever. You're you're going to sell accounting programs. Everybody does the same thing. Accounts receivable, payable, reports taxes, all that stuff. I don't know anything about accounting, but I can say everybody does this similar activities. It's like paying your taxes, actually. Everyone does similar activities. Long story short, you get all the services and the components, and you sell them. They're already made, and you sell them to customers. You say, okay, what do you need? Oh, you just need HR? Here you go. Here's the HR module. Here's the service. So it could be software, or it could be a service, like run on another server and you're selling them pieces and components and services to meet their needs and you've got the package that comes together that makes it custom versus going to Fry's and buying QuickBooks or buying something that's already pre-packaged which is the same concept that existed long 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 time ago with this COTS thing <laughs> so it's off the shelf meaning it's already made but it's customized it's customized to suit your needs and you're not buying the whole thing so it's an application is built for you. All C custom or uh, CBD technologies adhere to um, software service oriented architectures, which are architectures that are providing services. So the services are the same as the components, by the way, uh, which are the same as the small self contained blocks of code, which is the same as pre built software. So I have an entire lecture seven, which I believe gets into cloud technology and service-oriented architectures, along as software as a service. Because right now, actually, to bring this full swing all the way and include a preview of lecture, I believe it's lecture seven. I can't remember if I re renamed that. But um, long story short, everything software as a service. Because why install it? Why install something? Why buy something? when you can just get the service. So people do this with Salesforce.com, they do it with accounting software, you do it with payroll software. You just sign up for licenses. Yeah, everyone needs it. Why, why should everyone have their own program? They can all log into a network and the network has all these programs. And if you put it, make it into a cloud service, then you have a software service layer on it and the software service layer can basically be the portal for a lot of businesses and a lot of individuals. So they keep saying, and I'm waiting for this to happen, and you can quote me about four or five years from now, that Microsoft Office will be a service. So I think it already is pretty much turning into a service at this point. The 360 is a service. So, But I believe you can still get the original, and this original is still supported. Yeah, the only problem is if you're out in the Midwest and you don't have, you have dial-up connection, you don't have a high-speed access, it's going to be really hard to use software as a service, which is why it hasn't kicked in full swing everywhere. Until we can guarantee high bandwidth to everybody in the United States or most people in the United States, we can't deliver services that way. So. But they have changed their edit and update module to your hard drives. Yeah. So you can update and edit in your hard drive. On your hard drive. You get connected, it changes everything that you want. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's you good. Can, so it's hybrid. It's not all. It's not all. They keep saying that you won't even be able. You have to log in. You won't. You won't even be able to access your local. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, you might not necessarily have a strong internet connection, or you might not have a connection at all. Which is my problem with tablet devices that don't have 3G or 4G on them. It's like they're almost useless. Because you have to have Wi-Fi connection somewhere in order to use it. You don't have Wi-Fi, you want to just throw it out the window. It doesn't work. It's useless. <laughs> so my iPad, all my devices have 3G or 4G on them. So they definitely have ser service as a software as a service. My my cellular service is a, re a requirement these days. Um, so self sourcing. So I'm going to go through formulae. I I, I kind of gave you and introduced a lot of these terms to you last time. So I'm going to kind of finish up. Um, this one here, the self-sourcing, and user development, which means you're making it yourself. So the developer and the support team of IT systems um, by end users with little or no help from IT specialists actually create their own programs. Um, well, can a um, an admin do it? 
depends on the type of program she's using or he's using, I guess. But you have to be a certain type of end user in order to participate in self-sourcing. You may also be able to find somebody else in your company. So it's not just you by definition. This definition looks like it's a do well, it says do it yourself system development approach. Or do it yourself with the people at your company that you're friends with or that <laughs> can help you, or maybe not necessarily friends with, but they'll hire to help you, kind of thing. So it can relieve IT specialists the burden of developing many smaller systems. The self-sourcing um, works a lot with spreadsheets these days, with Microsoft Access, with different little projects that can be done with common day development language. Visual Basic actually is used a lot these days for this. So is ASP and JSP and stuff. So as long as you have access to, to, the, uh, to the tool sets and the utilities that you need, then there's no reason why you can't um, do it yourself. It's kind of like you know, do it yourself project. So the approach is similar to a traditional software development lifecycle model. A uh, big exception is that the design, development, testing, and the implementation are replaced by processes of prototyping. Because a lot of the self-sourcing is replaced by bigger systems. So you might say that the EMS was an originally a self-sourced um, project because we had a couple people actually who wrote it um, that did it themselves instead of going out and getting we had Moodle before the EMS and they looked at Moodle and they went oh we can do this and they put one together I think using WordPress originally and Ruby and Ruby on Rails is the framework for it and then uh, that kind of turned into the system it was sort of a self-sourced because we developed it internally and it was originally developed by just one or two guys it wasn't really that many people so it's definitely a project uh, that was done in-house, that's for sure. Um, so prototyping is the process of building models, and in this case, continuing to refine those models until they become a final system. For, and then what you could do also, and I've seen this done successfully a lot of times, is self take the self-sourcing approach, take what you put together, and give it to somebody. Say, here, can you build me a real system that looks like that, does like that, works like that, but done better. So then, or put this online for me. I want it on the internet. And then what ends up happening is you gave them a really just a three-dimensional requirements document, <laughs> a prototype that basically shows you what you want to do. But people do that. They've been doing that with architecture for years, building paper-based or graphing models and things, which are prototypes of big buildings, and say, here, build this for me. <laughs> Here's the design. So it's sort of like taking the same approach and using, applying it towards software or hardware development. So here's our approach for uh, self-sourcing. So we have one is planning, two analysis, and then we're sort of building it in the prototyping phase and then going back up to maintenance. And then we're going, well, does anything need to change? Let's plan it. So a lot of spreadsheets get built this way, a lot of Microsoft Access programs, um, a lot of small stuff. You can't really self-source a huge accounting system unless you're a software developer. And then if you're writing it yourself and you are the software developer, then you're self-sourcing it, essentially. But, uh, advantages improves requirements determination, yet the customer is building it, which is sort of the same advantage you get with agile approaches. When you have the customer involved in it, then you've got the ability for the customer to get what they want. So increases user end user participation and sense of ownership. People are more loyal to something that they build themselves than they are to something that they purchased. So, Especially after someone has slaved over it. <laughs> They're definitely going to be promoting it throughout the company. Yes, use my program. Yes, use it. Increases speed of development. Yeah, it takes all the hiring and everything out of the beginning and all of the up uptime for the development team to understand what you want to build. Reduces the invisible block backlog. Excuse me. Um, Invisible backlog is a list of all systems that an organization needs to develop, but because of the prioritization of the system development needs, never get funding because of the lack of organizational resources. Well, the invisible backlog is it never made it into the project because it's not something that meets the critical success factor of the organization, or it's not something that no one that everybody sees as a definite requirement. So people go ahead and do it themselves instead. So if the company won't approve it and they don't want to do it, then you end up doing it yourself. But people do that all the time with equipment, actually. So this invisible backlog is when actually people do it all the time with their cell phones. 
you know, when they say, you know, you have to wait, well, there's a, a new phone, I guess it's T-Mobile, that you don't have to wait two years anymore, but the back, the invisible backlog is when you have to wait a certain amount of time to renew your phone, but you don't want to. <laughs> so you self-source it by renewing it before the contract's up, by going, well, it's going to cost me $100 if I end the contract now, but I get six more months left, and this phone over here, and you weigh all the costs and everything, that's about the same. Oh, okay, it's $50 more. I'm going to go ahead and do it. That's kind of the invisible backlogging. You're, you're avoiding that backlog by having to wait or not getting funding or not being able to do what you want to do because of system resources. And the resources are company resources if you're talking about doing something for work. So Disadvantages to self-sourcing. Inadequate end-user expertise leads to inadequate development systems. Developed systems, yes. If unless that's what I was saying before, unless you're a software developer, this isn't going to work. Or unless you know a software engineer or a developer who's got the skill set, not going to work. So you got a spreadsheet or a Microsoft Access database that's doing something that maybe Oracle should be doing, or something that some sort of a front end UI should be doing. Lack of organizational focus creates privatized IT systems. Yeah, it's like you know all of a sudden now the IT department is every person for themselves. <laughs> You have your own priorities based upon your own department needs or your own management needs. And nothing is really for the good of the company anymore. Now you're just working for yourself. So you're, you're going to upgrade your network. You're going to upgrade your stuff. Everybody else is going to suffer because they're not going to get it. I guess it's not a priority for everybody. It's just a priority for you kind of thing. Or insufficient analysis of the design alternatives leads to subpar IT systems. Well, or not considering alternatives. It's actually, there's a lot of people out there that go out of their way to do something when they probably could have just bought it. <laughs> like, oh, you know what? They sell those programs. Oh. After you spend six months working on this thing, trying to get it to work, go to Fry's, buy it, install it, you'll be done. So, which is, and because they're, they have blinders on, so they don't know the alternatives. They don't know what choices they have. A lack of documentation and external support leads to short-lived system. They're the only one. They wrote it. They're the only ones who know how to use it. And uh, once they stop using it, everybody else is going to stop using it as well. So the right tool for the job. End users must have development tools. How many end users have programming languages installed on their computers? Well, that's what I say. Unless you're a software engineer, you're not going to have it. So the end user tools aren't as good as uh, some of the development tools that are made for professionals. Uh, they are easy to use, and they support multiple platforms, and they offer low cost of ownership, and they also have a support for a wide range of data types and abilities. Um, but they're generally fourth generation, or they're something higher than that. They're GUI, you know, plug and play stuff. That's why I say, you know, a lot of people disagree with me and argue, and they say, well, I call Visual Basic. I think Visual Basic is a really good end user development tool. If anyone has ever used Visual Basic, it's not a programming language. <laughs> it's up a prototyping language. Huh? Up to five years. Up to well, until they added all the .NET stuff. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. When they added all the .NET stuff, they kind of took away the prototyping kind of feel that Visual Basic used to have. But you could, in the old days, you could just drag some stuff over and put some buttons on there, put some labels on some buttons, you know, and just click away. And within five minutes, ten minutes time, you have like an application. And the good thing about Visual Basic was it matched the MFC libraries are the same because it's all part of Microsoft Visual Studio. So when you put your prototype together, and now I'm talking about prototyping, but it looked like the finished product. Actually, they could take in the real developer in Visual C++ could take that Visual Basic piece of crap you put together and turn it into like a real product, turn it into like something written in C++. Or ASP or whatever it happens to be. And well, Visual Basic and ASP are kind of on the same line. They use the same language, they use the basic language. So. Long story short, Visual Basic is a couple levels above C in terms of the generation. The higher the level, the easier it is to work in, the less efficient the program actually is. The final product is not quite as is memory efficient or computationally efficient or mm, sophisticated is the ones underneath it. To take and write the same program in Visual Basic as you would in C++, you get twice the file and twice the overhead on the Visual Basic one. 
C++ is going to a little, we're just going to run a little faster. You're going to be able to do a little bit more with it from a lower level implementation perspective. But uh, I call that a programming, I, I, excuse me, I call that a prototyping language. Others, in fact, I'm going to hear the YouTube comments come back on this one. Others would disagree with me and say, that, no, Visual Basic is a programming language just as good as Java, just as good as C++ or Objective-C and all those other languages out there. And I would definitely respectfully disagree with that. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> and that's all I'll say about that. And then people will say, well, Visual Basic is supposed to be object-oriented. <sighs> Come on. I wouldn't even call it an object-oriented language either. But, okay, I'm going to get off on this one because then this is really going to give me bad PR on the YouTube site. <laughs> prototyping. <laughs> Let's talk about prototyping. Prototyping is a model of the uh, proposed products. Um, which is kind of interesting. The original concept of the prototype was going back to that philosophy that a picture says a thousand words, you know, and that you can make a visual that is going to express what it is you're talking about easier than like giving someone 20 pages to read. So if that's the case, then you prototype it. And you're prototyping, you're, you're coming up, and then we had different fidelities of prototype. We had high and low fidelity prototypes where low fidelity was done on a piece of paper and a pencil. When you drew a picture of something, that was a low fidelity. And then we had high fidelity that came out. High fidelity was, let's put it on the computer. And then for the longest time, around the 80s to the 90s, we had prototyping tools. There's no more prototype. Well, there are, but they're kind of hard to find. Not so popular anymore. Because what ended up happening is some of these prototyping tools turned into languages. I mean, they were pretty detailed. If you're going to spend this much time to learn a prototyping tool <laughs> to figure out how you're going to make this part move and that part move and this screen look like this. For example, Director was used for the longest time. Flash is still used. Flash came out of that entire... Flash started out as a prototyping tool. Now it's a major tool that people program in for, for uh, internet applications. Um, but Macromedia, all that stuff came out of this whole prototyping stem where, you know, and anyway, as the tools got more popular and they got more feature rich, they turned into complicated monsters and then people just started real prototypers who don't, who are not programmers got like, oh no, I'm not using this anymore and kind of steered away from it. So nobody does prototyping anymore because who's supposed to be doing the prototyping are the low tech people, the people who don't know programming. If you know programming, you're going to use Visual Basic or you're going to use I, I, yeah, I think Visual Basic is a really good prototyping tool. So is ASP. Really good prototyping tool. People will like look at me and go, what do you mean? We wrote, we wrote an entire company application in ASP. I'm like, great, but good prototyping tool. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd use ASP. I don't think I would use JSP for it either, but I'm a totally different, different perspective on that. Anyway, long story short, uh, compared to other prototyping tools on the market, Visual Basic's easier to learn. So... Unless you want to pick up and so some of it turned into direct so some of it turned into demo demo software. For the longest time we had demonstration software. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about shareware or freeware or open source. I'm talking about software development techniques to create something that, you know, you're gonna prototype in. So to round out that explanation, shareware is real software that's for sale, that's commercial, but you're getting it for free, like freeware. Freeware, you get the whole program, you get to use every single feature in the whole program, and it's free. But it's private. You don't get the source code for it. Shareware is like demo trial version. Somebody privately made it, no source code for it, you don't get the whole thing. It only works for 30 days or 15 days. Open source not owned by anybody, not commercialized, not privatized. You get the source code, you get everything, and all features work. So people commonly say, oh, isn't that open source? And you're like, no, that's shareware. Or no, that's freeware. Or no, that... <laughs> and the funny thing is, is we get all of it with apps these days. There's shareware apps, freeware apps, and open source apps actually out there, which is actually kind of funny. We have all, we have, it's all still alive and running, and this is back from the early 70s when this stuff came out. So, But people used to use shareware and freeware as prototyping. You get the prototype system. Well, it's shareware, or it's freeware. 
and then you as or as sometimes then then it turned into beta releases. Oh, I'm a beta tester. And then we're not a beta testing anymore. We don't actually we do for some internet products, but not as widespread as before. So. So a prototype is the model, prototyping is the process of building the model and then demonstrating. So you can have a model, you just have prototype, but if you're prototyping, you're actually showing the model to somebody or you're testing the model and you're providing feedback on the model. So you're providing some sort of a feedback loop and you're making suggestions for the proposed system that is going to be developed. So you can do prototyping for proof of concept prototyping. They did that. It was actually kind of funny. If you go to the trade shows, the um, oh, they have them at the civic centers and at the you know conference centers. The like Comdex was the old one. CES is the newer one for the Las Vegas show. And they have the annual, the Mac Worlds. And all. you see all these products that come out. They oh look at this, the three D glasses. The one, the one of the most famous products I ever saw was the proof. It was a proof of concept pr concept prototype for the foot mouse. Never made it to the never made it to the market for many different reasons, and I know I've already talked about this story before, but uh, I can't remember if it was this class or not. But yeah, was not this class? Well, they had it set up at a booth and they videotaped, and then it was shown on a Google. It was on a Google channel on YouTube, actually. This was like maybe about two conferences ago in San Francisco at the Google. It wasn't Google I/O. It was a similar one. They had a chair and then people sat down in the chair. First people who probably tried to do is, you know, they have to take your shoes off. So then we had the napkins over the mouse. Then we had the socks. Then we had the people that would just put their foot on the mouse. And I'm thinking this is like the people who go through the airport security and take their shoes off and they just walk right through. I personally can't stand that. I, I mean, I feel like I need to take a shower after I get out of that because my feet, I stepped on fungus or something. That I, and I'm a germaphobe. I can't handle that. I didn't sit down at the mouse. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't sit down at the mouse. Long story short, it was actually kind of an interesting, hilarious video of all the people things did. And somebody tried to touch it. And like, oh, no, don't touch that. Somebody put their foot on it. Long story short, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it works. The product actually works kind of works well. But unfortunately, no one wanted to put their foot on it. So where are you going to put this? And then I started thinking about it. I was like, well, when I walk up to somebody's desk, I have no problem touching a mouse. Although I'm a germaphobe, I have no problem touching other people's mouse, mice, or touching their keyboard and stuff. But I'm certainly going to take my shoe off and touch something with my foot. Although the foot's probably dirtier than the hands, I don't know. But long story short, it was an interesting proof of concept prototype that they saved themselves a lot of money making. I can't remember the name of the company that was making this thing either. Foot, foot type? Foot type. They made it for um, handicaps. Yeah. It's at now in a. Are they still on sale? Still on sale? <laughs> Thank you, Google. One hundred twenty-nine dollars for this thing. Is it the the pad one or is it the one with the buttons? We have the picture. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. Then after that product, then we had the dance thing that came out, where you got points, dance a thon. You know, then that worked because you could wear your shoes, and you you had the little pad you put out there. Yeah, it's kind of like the old days of Twister, yeah, you know, but this one actually read your information. That's what that thing does. Yeah. Long story short, that isn't a good example of a proof of concept prototype because you can test it out before you actually waste the money putting it together. And see, in fact, for the foot mouse, it became a good product for a handicapped. Or, actually, I can't use that word anymore either. Apparently, according to the government, that's now derogatory. Yeah, so, special needs. Special needs, people. <laughs> Special needs people use the foot mouse. <laughs> and no, that will not be a question on the final exam. Who uses the foot mouse? <laughs> Selling prototypes. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're or you know, you you know a bunch of venture capitalists and you're in the nineteen eighties, no late no, this is nineteen nineties, mid nineteen nineties, and you live in a Silicon Valley, you can make a lot of money on selling prototypes or vaporware or products that don't exist. Where you convince someone who invests millions of dollars into your product, and you show them pictures of the product. You know, those are your prototypes that you're selling, and you sell the prototypes. So it's used to convince people of the worth of the proposed system so that you can collect money from them and maybe build the system. The problem with the dot com is people really, really, really sold vaporware. Really didn't even have a prototype, they just had a concept. 
So you find a fast talker who can describe the system. Oh yeah, this product is going to be the best foot product on earth. And you don't even have to take your shoes off and yada, yada, yada. And then, um, anyway, that's vapor. Well, it doesn't exist. So it's a selling a prototype. So prototype used to be used for selling products and services. Well, because you want to build it, but you don't have the money to do it. And you're looking for people to, to buy it. And there's actually a lot of people in the dot-com bust era, well, before the bust, who sold companies and sold products and services that didn't exist as well. <laughs> so, and a lot of stock that didn't that didn't equate to anything either. So, no wonder it busted. So, uh, prototyping process involves four steps: identifying the basic requirements, developing initial prototypes, and then reviewing it. And then you have your, your user review, and then revise and enhance the prototype. Another thing people use, and it's not on the slide set, but another way of prototyping is you're making a you're making a requirement clear, or you're making a feature understandable. So you're in the requirements phase, and you build a prototype of something to say, is this what you're talking about? Because the development team doesn't understand what the user wants. It's a test model. So it's a test model. Yeah, you're testing the requirement. You may also be testing the feasibility of the requirement. You know, like we want it to do this, this, and this, and this while we're driving. Okay, you know, so it's a proof of concept, but it's also a test to make sure what combination. And then you can show the customer, you know, here's A, B, and C. This is the three different ways we figured out how to do this. Which one do you like better? And then they can pick it. Actually, the other thing that a lot of contracted software engineers do these days is come up with different pricing models with different implementations. So customer comes up to you and says, hey, I need this software written. Can you write this for me? And here's what I want. But And this is what I want to pay. And then that's the, that's the mistake right there. Never mention what you want to pay. So instead, you have to have the software developer come back and say, you know, give me a price quote, but don't mention any money if you're the user. That's a mistake right there. Because in, inevitably what happens is the price that comes back to you is going to be exactly what you said plus a couple thousand dollars, you know, just to make sure it didn't seem exactly what you were willing to pay. And then you have to question, what am I really going to get for this? But long story short, Another thing they do is they do pricing models. They can go, well, this is what you asked for. And it's A, B, C, and D. And just hear me out, hear me out. We can do it all for you. And it'll be top grade, the best system you've ever had. But it's $50,000. Oh. OK, wait a minute. Option number two. <laughs> it's like half of it. And then, then, then eventually you're going to spend $50,000. But you're, no, actually, eventually you're going to spend $100,000. And you're going to get the $50,000 system. Because the second option is going to be less than half of it. It's going to cost more than half of that one. Plus, it's going to be incrementally more expensive for you to build it. So in that token, you just go for the big one. You just go all the way, and you cut them down on the price. So 50, I'll do it for 40. You can do it for 40. I'll, do it. I'll take it for 40. You know, and then you get them come down to something reasonable. And then you've got them committed to all of the features that you want. So unfortunately, you have to take a class in order to buy software. And you have to take a class in order to sell software. <laughs> Mandatory now, is it mandatory now? <laughs> pricing model. Yeah, you should. Otherwise, you don't. Because it ends up, software is funny. People can't see, touch, smell software. Software just does it doesn't have an, a body of existence to it. No, not like hardware. When you buy a car, you know what you're buying. You can visually see it. Unfortunately, software is a totally different animal, right, in itself. And so the quality of that software is hard to see it, hard to judge it. So are the features, actually. So it does take a, quite a strategy to it. So here's prototyping process compared with insourcing and self-sourcing prototypes. And what you end up with, we'll just go down to this little thing here, continues with steps until the prototype becomes the final system on the self-sourcing. On the insourcing, we've got sort of the same concept going on. It looks very similar where we have step number one, identifying basic requirements, and then getting into the development phase of the first model of the prototype, getting the knowledge workers to review it, to take a look at it, and then, is it okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? And then eventually coming out with a finished product. Oh, I believe it is attendance time. So let me pause this video. Oh, let's capture Okay, so this is where we left off. Um, I was talking about prototyping process. 
um, in the comparing the insourcing with the self-sourcing prototyping and looking at this concept where in most of the steps we're reiterating back and forth between the prototype. So one of the interesting things with the prototyping process and not mentioned yet and not in a slide set is we often have a problem of scope creep that happens with this. When someone builds a prototype and it starts working and it's solving a problem and then all of a sudden it gets another new feature added to it and then another new feature added to it, the prototype never ends, it never gets finished, but that's not the problem. The concept of the prototype or the system that's being built is changing and turning into a hybrid system. So the accounting people got their accounting program, let's say, and then all of a sudden the HR people come up to, hey, you know what? You know, your system's working so great. Can you add this feature in there for us? And then another department comes over and says, hey, you know what? Um, can I also uh, keep track of our uh, bathroom scheduling, our bathroom cleaning schedule? And then, uh, well, can I also keep track of our attendance for the students? And all, you know, all these features come in and say, what is this thing? I thought it was an accounting program. And then all of a sudden the program concept changes and you have this monster application that doesn't fit anything. It doesn't do anything well at one point because it just adapted too much. So advantages of prototyping encourages active user participation, which is a, the pro, but it also causes a problem with scope creep. Uh, it helps resolve discrepancies among users, gets everybody on the same page, there's no surprises at the end, gives users a feel for the final system, and helps determine technical feasibility and helps sell the idea of the proposed system. In rare cases, actually not rare, about 50% of the time, customers end up liking the prototype better than the real system. So they don't know it's a prototype. And then all of a sudden you deliver the real system and they look at it and they go, well, I like the other one you had. What was that other one you were working on? You know, that's not the system we wanted. That We wanted the other one. And then the other one was the prototype, but they liked that better than the software you gave them, uh, which is kind of an interesting problem. So then you go back and you redo the software to match the prototype because that's what you sold them. That's what they wanted. Disadvantages of prototyping leads people to believe the final system will follow. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, the development team came, back, team came back with this prototype, and they did it in a week. Wow, cool. So next week we're going to get the real system. <laughs> no, it's going to be like six months to a year from now, and you're going to get the real system. Prototypes are easier to do, so but end users don't understand that. And it gives no indication of performance under operational conditions. Well, that's the interesting thing. Uh, so you prototype a feature, you put it in a prototype, and then you put it out on the main system after you build it, and then you discover, oh, this is slow, or oh, wait a minute, this isn't even technically possible, or all of a sudden you have operational conditions that are unpredictable. And it also leads the project team to forego proper testing and documentation as well, because it worked in the prototype, then it must work in the real system, and we match the prototype, therefore why do we need to test this thing? It should work just fine. When it doesn't normally do that, it's a different system, you're not testing. Or, better yet, the development team tests the prototype, but they don't test the real system. <laughs> Which is actually kind of an interesting question, you know, question of <coughs> priority to begin with, but... Outsourcing. So outsourcing is delegating the specific work to a third-party company or third-party for a specific length of time and a specified cost and a specified level of service. Everyone's familiar with outsourcing. It's another buzzword they use these or have been using for the last 10 years. And the third who option of the system development after insourcing and self-sourcing is outsourcing in terms of who's going to build the system. So... Outsourcing, you know why Americans don't like outsourcing? I want to know, never quite figured out why Americans don't like outsourcing. It produces cheaper software, or it was producing cheaper software. We're not outsourcing anymore. Now we're insourcing or self-sourcing these days. We're not, we're not outsourcing anymore um, because it's too expensive. We were doing it because it was cheaper. But I think some Americans felt it was taking jobs away. It was bringing jobs out of the country, which was the major problem with it. Only problem with that, <coughs> however, is it's, it's now it was supporting other com uh, other countries, and aren't we supposed to be helping out the entire world? You know, we're the U.S., right? So aren't we supposed to be like everybody's helper? So anyway, long story short, so much pol politics and political crap that went on with outsourcing, um, it almost has a bad name. When you when I when I okay when I mention this over in East Bay, when I teach over there, and I mention outsourcing. 
I get half the room and goes, oh, yeah, that's bad. I mention it here, you guys go, yeah, yeah, my cousin works for that company. <laughs> or, you know, you're, over here you have a totally different impression of it. Over there, you know, if I said I love outsourcing, people like start throwing stuff at me because they're like, what do you mean? Aren't you American? You're going to take away jobs from Americans, blah, blah, blah. Here's the exact opposite. Well, you guys mostly are from a country that has heavily profited from outsourcing for the most part and is still profiting from it, which is good. I think it's personally a good thing because it brings a cheaper development model into the U.S. and makes it easier and cheaper to get stuff done. And we don't have to have the labor in-house or the labor in-country. So, And I work, in the, I work in the industry. I don't care. So I don't know. Long story short, I never quite figured out why people were so insecure about their jobs, you know. And you know how many jobs it actually created back in the time, back when it was good? Outsourcing is not the thing anymore. But back when it was not the current trend. But back when it was the current trend, it was good. So many different new positions in management <coughs> created to manage the outsourced projects. So, so many different jobs were created in the U.S. because of that. So it actually did more good than bad, in my personal opinion. But the main reasons behind the rapid growth of outsourcing industries include globalization, yes, the Internet, a growing economy and low unemployment rate, and uh, technology deregulation. Actually, a problem right now is we have more regulation, more taxes, more requirements, more labor laws, all bunch of stuff now. It kind of destroyed the concept. <coughs> um, outsourcing options. So we have uh, purchase existing software made by somebody else. Purchase existing software and pay for a publisher to make certain modifications to that existing software. Purchase existing software and pay for the publisher for the rights to make modifications yourself to it. Treat it like open source. <coughs> um, or outsource the development of an entirely new and unique system for which no software exists yet. Only problem with outsourcing is you have to know what you want. And you have to go through the first part of the life cycle if you're going to outsource, which means you have to do your requirements. You have to be, as a user, you have to be involved in it, or as the customer. You can't just say, you know, go online and say, yeah, here, click this button, click this button, click this button. Okay, yeah, make this for me. It doesn't quite work that way, which is what people thought. It replaced everything. <clears throat> so here's our outsourcing options, purchasing existing software, ones with modifications. This is basically a picture of the last slide I just showed you. So, so like self-sourcing, the self-sourcing process looks similar to the traditional software development lifecycle model, actually. So a big exception. Here is that you don't outsource most of the work to another company. It's just a, the implementation or just the development. You can actually outsource. Actually, to talk about outsourcing, it's not really fair because people gave software development outsourcing a bad rap. But all of our companies, HP, Com oh, Compaq back in the day, I think even Google does this, Expedia, everybody, call centers. They outsource the customer service and the technical support to third world countries, <laughs> to, you know, Mexico, or not to call Mexico a third world country, but anyway, outside of the U.S., to lower developed countries, because it provides jobs for them. Nobody complains about that. So. But mostly, when you call a company, you're getting someone who's, uh, you know, in a different time zone, in a different area of the world. You're not, you're not getting someone who's next door in Sunnyvale, so. Which is the same thing, in my opinion. <clears throat> so, and then in the U.S., are you going to outsource um, your photocopying? Yeah, sometimes. Are you going to make a book yourself? Are you going to print it yourself? No, you're going to outsource it. Are you going to put your own router and your own tower and your own cell phones? No, you're going to outsource it. <laughs> so everybody outsources their IT needs. No one puts T1 lines in. You subscribe to services. You, uh, you know, you get other people to T-Mobile or Verizon service you're not going to put you're not going to create your own cell phone company so if you think about it as a service you're outsourcing most of everything you're doing as a consumer so unless you want to build your own computer and your own tablet and your own then you're not outsourcing so. uh, that's a big exception is uh, where 
what part are you going to do? So here's the outsourcing lifecycle model, where we have a planning stage that doesn't change. We have a defining scope, selecting the target system, establishing, establishing the requirements, the local requirements. What are you going to build locally? Developing the request for proposal. What are you going to have somebody else build? Evaluate the request for proposal and return and select, select the vendor, someone to build it. Uh, create a service level agreement. And that's the interesting part you don't get with. Um, that's the interesting part you don't get with building it in house. <coughs> There's no warranty when you build it in house. <laughs> There's no service level agreement. Um, and if there were, well, what are you going to do? So the person you're a software engineer and you're working for a company and they say, hey, make this program. Program doesn't work. What are the worst thing they can do? Fire you? They're not going to fire you. They need you to fix the program. So you pretty much have job security at that point. <clears throat> but there's no service level agreement. There's no agreement that you're going to stay with the company. There's nothing. When you outsource, you have all that if you build it into the contract. So you have, oh, here's the software. I don't like it. I'm not paying for it. Go away. <laughs> you can do that with an outsource company. This isn't what I asked for. If Bob over in the, in the, in the development team delivers the product and you say, I don't like it. I just paid Bob to work for this company for six months full-time and overtime to make, give me something I don't like. I'm the one eating the cost. So in a lot of ways, you're saving a lot of money outsourcing. If you get something back that's not what you asked for, you don't necessarily have to pay for it if it's in your agreements. So problem is people couldn't figure out how to do the agreements correctly. And then you need a manager just to keep track of the contract and just keep track of the progress and what's going on and... Anyway, long story short, you can't just, you know, hire someone and think you're going to get it all done. <clears throat> it's a little bit more complicated than that. So in outsourcing, you're developing two vitally important documents, a request for proposal and a service level agreement. The request for proposal is outlining what you want and how much you're going to pay for it and when it's going to be delivered and what quality it's going to have. And then your service level agreement is, you know, did I do the taillight warranty in this class? It's the taillight warranty. You know, I you can call me for help and I'll answer questions for you as long as I can see your taillights. <laughs> when you've driven far enough away from me and I can't see those taillights anymore, <clears throat> no more service level agreements. <laughs> Be like, who are you? What did you buy from me? <clears throat> so you have to give a, you don't have a taillight warranty. So, well, you have a taillight warranty, so you need to have a service level agreement to um, actually get something out of the outsourced company. And uh, you can probably blame most of the failures of outsourced products from the U.S. on these two components right there. So, And then compound that with some new government regulation because the government doesn't like the fact that the citizens don't like the fact that everything's being outsourced. So they're going to make life more difficult. So, so here's our request for proposal. And uh, actually, you get this with Craigslist people, too. In fact, I've done this in the past with people. You know, you see these, uh, you put an ad up on Craigslist, and you ask for a request for a proposal. And like 50% of the time, you might actually get one that comes back. You know, for freelance people, you know, I need someone to develop a website for me. You know, let's say I don't have the time to do it. I just want to outsource it to somebody. So I put an ad up on Craigslist. Hey, develop a website for me that does this, this, and this. And... Um, these are the features it wants, and you're telling you how much it's going to be, how when you can deliver it, and reply to this email address, and you know, give me a re submit a request for proposal. Okay, and then I get this thing. Hey, I'll do it for you for fifty bucks. I'm like, well, that's not a request for a proposal. <laughs> so then you can weed out all the ones that don't give you what you actually asked for, and then you see some decent ones. And normally you have um, it's a formal document describes what's going to happen in detail. How long is it going to take? What are you going to put in there? What platform is it going to be on? What vendors are you going to use? What software are you going to write it in? How many weeks is it going to take you? What are you going to charge me? It's kind of like submitting a bid to the government. Actually, the government won't take your bid unless your bid's in the right format, meets the right, has the right, has the right format to it, contains the right information. Otherwise, it gets thrown out before it even gets considered. And the bids that get considered usually aren't the lowest ones in price. It's the ones that have the better deal to it. So you're offering service after you deliver it. You're offering this, you're offering that. And then you're charging twice as much as everybody else, and then they'll pay it. <laughs> so 
So it's not that based on price, unfortunately. Well, if it was based, just based on price alone, then that would dictate how software was built. So, In sourcing, you must tell another organization what you're going to develop and what you want. You can do that with a request for proposal. So it's done for insourcing, outsourcing, ads on Craigslist. It's done for everything. And if you're working as a contract programmer, normally you have a template that you use. You know, you fill it out because you want them to sign it. Because you don't want to work for two weeks and then give them something and go, hey, where's my check? You know, you, if you have a contract or something that binds the agreement and some sort of a non-disclosure or some sort of a non-compete, which is what they're going to have you sign, means you can't build me this, this thing and then I'm going to go give it to somebody else and give it to somebody else. So you get this with a lot of new, or newer app developments actually right now. Because people try to sell the same stuff over and over again to the, each vendor. Like if I'm a, working for Pizza Hut or something and I'm going to build them a pizza ordering app, you know, then I'm going to go over to Pizza R Us and Luigi's Pizza and I don't know, what's the other one? Caesars, Little Caesars Pizza. I'm going to sell them the same app. There's got to be something in the contract that uh, precludes me from doing that, hopefully. Therefore, your request for proposal must be very detailed and complete. And some can take months or even years to develop. I hope not. Not for an app, because then you're going to have different software out after a year comes by. So our service level agreement, we get service level agreements with software and hardware. We get it with insourcing and outsourcing. We get it with everything. Everything should have a request for proposal. Everything should have a service level agreement. Service level agreement is the no-brainer. Half the people leave it out, just like they leave out the request for proposal. A lot of small-time programmers who do a lot of work didn't ever get paid for it and end up supporting this customer forever until the person starts stalking them and then you have to file a restraining order because the person keeps showing up at your front door and like, I sold you the software, go away. But they want, the, they want you to fix a problem and then fix a problem after that and then fix a problem after that. It's not like the Maytag repairman who sits at home watching TV. Usually the customer is doing something wrong with it. And so what ends up happening is you spend more time free work, fixing and modifying and adding new features to the software way past the time that you actually collected any money on it. So then you end up going broke because you're working for free for this vendor, for this customer who you just can't get off your back, can't satisfy. So the service level agreement is a formal contractual obligation between the two parties generally referred to or specifying the support. So in outsourcing, it's a legal agreement between the two vendors indicating what's going on and when and how much you're going to pay and supporting the service level agreement with specifications and service level objectives. So you have some sort of a benchmark. I will keep the system running for two years. So if you have a major problem with the system, I was the one that built it, you can give me a call if it's within two years or something. And then if I do, this is where service companies come into place. There's a bunch of companies, not so much anymore, but back when outsourcing was really popular, there's a bunch of service companies who go out and fix outsource software <laughs> because nobody in the company has the expertise. They outsourced it. They got the software back in. So for the longest time, they were hiring contractors all over the place to work in the field. You just go out to companies and you work on... This, you fix problems and you, you maintain software and service software that somebody else built and there's no expertise in house for it. It was outsourced, it came from somewhere, somebody did it. Maybe it's serviceable, maybe it's not, but you got paid to be out just to go out and help the customer. And then companies would actually subscribe to the service <laughs> because of the failures of everything that went on. And then they didn't get any service contract with what they bought, so nobody else is supporting it for them. It's kind of like if, um, it's actually sort of like grandparents when they buy computers. <laughs> and trust me, or even mothers, don't give your mom a computer unless you're, or actually it's my dad. It's, I should, okay, now I can't do this because they listen to my YouTube channel. <laughs> if you're going to be generous and provide them with computing resources, be prepared to support them. <laughs> that means... Every holiday, I get a computer that lands in my, on my table that says, Can you fix this? I got this pop-up ad that keeps showing up all over the place. <laughs> or the antivirus software that's out of date. Or 
the something that they installed on the web browser. The, long story short, comes with obligations. <laughs> Don't give it to them <laughs> unless it's fail proof. And actually, I'm not I'm not joking about this. I took away their Windows computers and I gave them Macs, my old Mac, and much better, much better. Don't give them Macs. <laughs> do, do, do not give an elderly person a Windows computer. <laughs> I shouldn't really say that while being recorded either, but I will tell you the Mac is <laughs> the Mac is just easier to support. <laughs> It's just like we don't have to worry about spyware, antivirus software, and there's nothing that gets installed when they don't know about it. So the only problem with that is you got to make sure email. Is, it's like a two-year-old. You give a computer to them, and oh look, you can buy this. And you click on this, and they click on that. Oh yeah, fill in your. Actually, it wasn't me. It was a friend of mine's uncle, 90-year-old guy. He kept putting his credit card numbers in, like the form comes up. What's your credit card number? And the guy will go find his credit card number and put it in there. It's, it's from the phone company, and it says phone company on the top. <laughs> well, there's a reason why people do that. It works. Just the same reason why telephone solicitation works. There's a sucker every day. If one out of a hundred says, okay, I'll contribute to this charity, or okay, you know, sign me up. You know, the guys, it's worth it. Door to door, people do it all the time. Anyway, outsourcing options. That was a tangent, but yes, that was service level. That was a service level agreement. If you're going to give a computer to somebody and they don't know how to use it, make sure to sign a service level agreement that says you're only going to show up once a week to fix computer problems and not twice or more. So, three different type forms of outsourcing onshore, nearshore, and offshore. Most people give offshore the bad rap. That's contracting with companies that are geographically far away. Nearshore is contracting with outsourcing agreements with companies in the nearby country or close. And then onshore is within the same country, same country of service. So most people don't use these terms anymore. They use offshore, so which means it's out of the country. So. Our onshore Nearshore is the neighboring companies, countries, like if you're in Southern California and you offshore nearshore to Mexico, that's a good example. Or you're in a tropical island somewhere in Hawaii and you're nearshoring to another island or something. So you're, you're close by. So offshore is primarily outsourcing. India, China, uh, hey, they have outsourcing people in India. Uh, Eastern Europe. Ireland, Philippines. We're almost done, don't worry. Advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing. <coughs> Advantages focuses on unique core competencies. Yeah, you get a company that actually builds software, and you don't. You bake cookies. You don't build software or something. And exploit the intelligence of another organization. Better uh, predict future costs acquiring leading edge technology. Reduce costs and improve performance and accountability. What do you guys know why a lot of the electronic components, this is terrible, but do you know why a lot of electronic components are outsourced offshore to China? Everything, Everything is, but do you know why, actually? For soldering PCB boards? It's terrible. It's not very politically correct for me to say this, but the little hands of children <laughs> can get better detail and they're more skilled with their fingers than older people. So you hire an adult to solder a PCB, you're not going to get the same quality as a child will. And yes, they hire children to solder the components on the board, and mostly do all of them doing the soldering. Because they have itsy bitsy little hands they can get in there, and they have the skill. You know, you get older, you drink too much coffee, your hands shaking, you know. Adults aren't quite as flexible, and aren't quite as skilled with their hands, so. Yes. <laughs> Very non politically correct lecture today. Okay, so disadvantages of outsourcing. Uh, reduces technical know how for future innovation. Yeah, somebody, you're relying on somebody else's technology, not yours. Uh, reduces degree of control. That's the biggest problem for most outsourced projects. 
increases vulnerability of the strategic information and increases dependency on other organizations. Yeah, if you think that's a problem, then it might be a problem. So, Okay, I think I've said everything that I should not have said, so I believe I am done for today. Um, there's nothing else I can say that's not politically correct. So, Any questions? Nothing question about the little hands or anything? No. Okay, no. good. <laughs> We'll leave that one alone then, too. It's true, actually. Huh? They have robots, but those are expensive. I'm talking about um, Guan, I shouldn't say it, the factories that are in uh, Guan Guan. Let me stop the video. Let me stop the video. I actually have some personal hands on experience.